you get a little, little something on your glasses on the other side there. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And you guys started making a um, render vision, I mean like machinima type render of thing. Render vision, yeah. thank you. That's I've heard that a long time, yeah. And do you still feel that there's like a market for it? For render vision? Yeah, for render vision, <laughs> well, exactly. I think machinima changed. I think when uh, we, we first got introduced to our global audience uh, via the machinima art form, because in places like Australia and in Europe, there was a lot more funding for arts and for discussion of the arts. Mm -hmm. So we were invited after, you know, Red versus Blue became popular, uh, we were invite, invited to conferences to talk about this pioneering method of animation that we were popularizing. And I remember there was all these articles being written about this is gonna change the way people tell stories, you know, it's gonna really revolutionize filmmaking, uh, and it didn't. Uh, mm -hmm. it, that's not what ended up happening. What ended up happening, I think, was there was a pivot in machinima of using video games to tell stories, and instead of being a storytelling method, it became a way for personalities to showcase their skills. And it went from story-driven to personality-driven, and that made the Let's Play movement. And so I, I look at what is now you know, streaming and Let's Play and all that, that is the successor to Machinima. Kind of inherited the legacy of it. Yeah. Yeah, the potential for what it could have been. So a lot of uh, Rooster Teeth content is now like live action, um, or a separate category like Rooster Teeth animation. I was just wondering if you were ever going to renew any of your machinima type um, projects like Panics or Supreme Commander or is it just now Red vs Blue because that's what kind of dominates you know, the machinima market now. Yeah, we've done a lot of machinima, but I don't know, like I say creative basis, we're not, we have no goal of going back to machinima. We, Red vs Blue is it, mm -hmm. is our show. Yeah, I think we like dabbling in it when something strikes our fancy and it seems like it would be fun to play around in a new game um, and you know, everyone uh, in the company uh, plays a lot of games so when something comes up you know that seems like this could be something cool you know people will talk about it and if somebody like really gets inspired once they're run with it there's certainly no uh, prohibition against that but it's just it's I think we've shifted to where we're, we're more focused on generating our own ideas and IP and, and um, figuring out how to execute that in whatever way makes the most sense yeah even the behind the scenes machinima uses that most people aren't aware of. There's a whole aspect of the company that doesn't really get seen because it's not in front of the camera, yeah. where we use machinima uh, for industrial, basically commercial aspects, where um, uh, somebody has a video game. We, had, we got a reputation for taking a video game, making it look as cool as it can be, but still being the video game. Mm -hmm. So obviously there's a huge commercial application for that. You know, when people get a game and they need to put a TV commercial together, we can get cool shots and we know how to do that, that, those things. Uh, but it's even even that work we're trying to move away from because it just detracts from the original content that we want to make. Okay. Um, I, don't have so I was just wondering, what was it that uh, kind of pushed you to go into the convention scene? Mm. Like, obviously, this is the tenth RTX um, across the world, and that's quite an achievement. But what was it that finally pushed you to get into to that? start our own? Yeah. Our, well, our community did. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it, we had been doing conventions, you know, attending other people's conventions like Comic-Con and uh, Otakon and PAX and all these kind of conventions for the longest time um, because we felt like it was a great way to get in touch with our community. And then I think it kind of just dawned on us like, hey, we're going to this other convention to meet our community. Why don't we just set up our own convention right. so we can really have a complete experience with the community and everybody can be focused and um, on, on what we all love and enjoy and embrace that. And for the audience, I think it was, you know, a great thing because they, you know, they get to talk to each other online, but a lot of people don't get to see each other in person. I met uh, two girls last night who have been what self-described best friends for six or seven years that met on the Rooster Teeth site, but had never met each other in person. And finally, because of this event, you know, because they're local, like, they got to come. I probably know the two girls you're talking about. Oh, did you meet them too? Yeah, well, yeah. were they at the party last night? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They got to meet each other, and you know, they're spending the whole weekend together, and it's oh. like, it's just an amazing thing. So I think stuff like that's really special. Live events are important. Uh, you know, we've taken, especially gamers are early adopters of new technology. And so gamers were among the first people to take all their social interactions and put them online which is great because you can talk, like my kids have friends that live in Sweden, and mm -hmm. I didn't have any friends in Sweden growing up. Uh, but the, what it takes away is that experience of seeing people in person, you know, 
I'm going to go super young here, but like slumber parties, sitting on the couch playing Nintendo with your friends, you just don't have that because you do all that stuff online, all that interaction. That's why these events are more important than ever because yeah. people are just, they're missing that, you know, and even if they've never had it, it's still part of who we are mm. and they want to connect. So people come to these live events and it's, it's very meaningful to do that. Mm. Is that in essence why you brought it to England now? Yes, for sure, yeah. And I mean, I think people are craving that intimacy and personal connection and, Maybe yeah. not so much in England. <laughs> <laughs> Politeness. Have you been on the tube? Like, Polite. don't talk to anyone? Polite interaction or non-interaction. <laughs> yeah, but it's a, I mean, it's a, it really is a different world now, you know, and, and Bernie and I both have kids that are teenagers and, like, have watched them grow up in a different, you know, kind of different atmosphere where, you know, to hang out with your friends, you don't ever need to see them in person, um, which in some ways is amazing and great, and in other ways is a little bit isolating. You know, so to be able to break down the walls of that isolation and get everybody together is just, I think it's a really fun thing. And so your company has grown like exponentially over the last few years. And um, how do you feel about, and it's very much, you know, personality driven with the people that work there. Do you find that yourself um, like cultivating these personalities or do they just grow naturally? Because obviously Ellie has grown um, as a personality because of your vlogs, Bernie. Mm -hmm. Do you find that, you know, staff members have a certain personality that you want to expose to the audience or how is that? Well I think we uh, are unique in terms of an online creator group in that we have multiple generations of cast and creators and a lot of groups don't have that. I mean most, we're rare as a group to begin with, most you know YouTube channels are named after a person, it's, you see that one person when yeah. you go to that channel. Um, but having new talent come in is very, very important to us. It's, uh, you know, it's the lifeblood of our company. It helps us discover new people. Like, you know, talk about Ellie, but also like working with Steven Suptic, mm -hmm. who's been great. Uh, you know, and then, you know, Greg Miller, everyone in the Let's Play family, Funhouse a couple of years ago. You know, finding those new voices and introducing them to our audience is really important. It also helps us get discovered by people who aren't aware of Richard Teeth as well. And then it's, I mean, it's, I was talking about this earlier too, but the diversity of the cast has grown as well, which is yeah. really important. Um, you know, and there's been a weird kind of organic diversification too, as we just continue to get older. It's, we have this age diversification of the company too, where we make different kinds of content than say, like Steven Subtick. We just, we make, we make different things. Even if we both make a vlog, even though you would not call it a vlog, <laughs> uh, our approaches to that format are significantly different. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's important to us on a number of reasons, and you know, just as creators, it, it keeps it fresh for us as well, you know. Um, and it's it's really fun to work with new people, and you feel invigorated by what they bring in and new personalities. And um, uh, I feel like we've been lucky, been fortunate to kind of be able to keep the overall aesthetic vision of Rooster Teeth pretty much intact, and. A lot of that, I think, is because the new people that we bring in largely have come out of our community. Right. You know, we meet, we've met tons of people at uh, conventions and other events. You know, people always ask us one of the, you know, invariably in any q and A's like, um, what can I do just to be successful in your field? Or what can I do to get a job at Rooster Teeth directly? And we really, we have hired people, like, literally who have stood up and asked questions, you know. Maybe not on the spot, yeah. but you know, that have come out of c conventions. I mean, our, like one of our first big events that we reference all the time um, that really broadened our minds to what the, the, the really the worldwide community was is after we finished the first season of Red vs. Blue, we did this big event in New York City. And I say big event now, but at the time, we just thought it might be like a cool thing where a couple of New Yorkers would show up, you know, to meet some people and, you know. Hopefully a, we can fill the theater. Hopefully we can fill the theater, have a couple of slices and go home, you know. Yeah. And uh, and when we got there, we were like amazed to discover that it wasn't just New York fans, but it was fans from all over the world that had come out. And uh, we met Gavin Free in, you know, in that process, who was, you know, from the lovely jolly old England and, and uh, yeah. became a huge part of our community. Luckily and his dad it, brought him over. Yeah. yeah, then became a huge part of uh, of the, the company overall and you know the, the, there was a lot of stories like that within Rooster Teeth. It was also we uh, it was a little bit early on was before like everyone had a camera on their phone but yeah. uh, I learned something else at that event would, was the power of the community and their attachment to each other uh, what we were building there we, we had a sense of it because on the forums when you see them together like you get numb to the numbers of the internet mm -hmm. like for Rooster Teeth those numbers are 38 million subscribers 
eight billion views. After a while, it's just like they, they don't make any sense. But then you come to an event like RTX and you see, you know, ten or fifteen thousand people. You get it's like, oh, that's huge. You know, you get the sense of the scale of it. Even though if we put up a video and it got ten thousand views, it'd be like, what happened with this video? <laughs> what? Maybe we should re-upload it. You know, it's like it's totally different ways to measure things. And in that uh, Lincoln Center screening, um, Gavin was in the first couple rows. 15-year-old kid from the UK, and somebody discovered that Gavin had never eaten an Oreo cookie, which is a very American thing. They're disgusting. Um, which we should strike if we ever get Oreo as a sponsor. <laughs> but uh, they discovered that, and somebody ran out and bought a package of Oreos, brought it back, and they made Gavin try an Oreo, and they're all filming it. And I'm watching them all, like they're filming it, and I shouldn't do it like this, because they were filming on video cameras. And there was like three or four people who had video cameras and were filming, and it's like, hey, we're seeing this. It's like when they get together, they make things, and I was curious, like, where are they gonna put that? Because it was before YouTube. Mm -hmm. And they were linking it off their profiles on the Rishi site. And that's, it was really cool. It was an early lesson that people who watch content want to make content. Mm -hmm. Kind of leads in, what advice would you give to aspiring content creators who has obviously you've dipped your toe in a lot of professions? Like, what would you, what advice would you give to people that want to start up YouTube or they want to start up streaming? Make a slow motion show. <laughs> <laughs> it's overdone. It is, it, is, yeah. <laughs> it is hard because the environment in which we came up is far different than today. Mm. Um, you know, just YouTube has provided a lot of opportunity to many creators, but in the same sense as the flip side of that coin, which is it has provided a lot of opportunity to all creators, for everyone to be a creator. So there's big noise floors, like everyone's making content and, and putting it online. Uh, we have, even with the size of our brand and the recognition of it, we still have trouble cutting through that noise floor. And we, we, when we launch something new, cutting through that. We can always show it to our audience, mm -hmm. uh, but we do make content that we hope will find a new audience the way Ruby has, where Yes, a lot of people who watch Red vs. Blue watch Ruby, but also the people that don't watch anything else. They just watch Ruby, and they've mm -hmm. discovered us via that show. And, but it's hard. It is hard to cut through that noise floor. I would say make content. Don't wait. Uh, yeah. There's no better time to make content in history than right now. And uh, stay consistent because there's, there's no other formula. You just have to be consistent and continue yeah. to make content. Yeah. There's yeah. Uh, success is, what's the quote? Success is like 99% perspiration and one percent inspiration yeah. you know i mean i do think consistency is like it, it was true for us back then i think it's the one constant that's really true now it's like if you keep working hard at something just chipping away i think you will get there eventually and, and you get uh, better every time you make something you get better every time and you can't let obstacles kind of be your reason for not moving forward you know we were just talking in a couple panels about you know, well, what do you do? People will ask, like, well, what do you do if you don't have this thing that you need or that thing that you need? And there's always going to be something you need, right, that you don't have. But if you look at it from a different perspective, they might just be things that you want, you know, and not actually need. And uh, and I also think, like, when you relate it, you know, in a in a narrative sense to thinking about your characters in a in a story, like you look at the second act of any story, it's always about overcoming obstacles. And uh, how are you going to develop and create interesting characters that are inventive and get through obstacles if you're not willing to do the same thing yourself in your own creative process? So, um, yeah, just keeping at it. I mean, that's why I keep moving forward is one of our mm -hmm. is one of our quotes because we don't always, always have anything that like, everything that we need. You know, even at e even at the the rate that we've grown and the size we are now, mm -hmm. there's always something more that we wish we had or you know. Uh, another tool in our arsenal, but if you just keep plugging away, those things come in time. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, I'm just following on to um, that previous question, do you have any advice for uh, YouTube creators in this current environment of adpocalypse kind of thing? Oh, uh, for uh, business revenue? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, one of our strengths Apply is... Apply <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think, feel like one of our strengths has always been diversification, mm -hmm. you know? It's uh, tough, though, for a new creator. It is tough, yeah. you know, but, I mean, there are lots of different ways to, to make money and do things now. There's a lot of makers out there, you know, and, like, if you're making something for a YouTube video, could you also make it for Etsy, you know, or something like that? I think there's there's almost always another way to to look at what you're doing. And, um, you know, I don't know what, what we learned uh, through several steps and iterations that, you probably shouldn't rely on anybody else's system, you know? True. Because yeah. those systems are gonna change and you don't have control over them and you gotta focus on the things you can control. It's like, for example, it's like the different parts of our business model. A lot of these things we had to create out of thin air 
uh, because they didn't exist. Um, and nowadays, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't allow you to do it. Like we would distribute our videos on our website and sell subscriptions through there. But now people can just post their things to YouTube and click a button to get ads on it. Um, you know, we had to make our own merch, which meant we printed our own shirts and stored them in a warehouse and shipped them out. We, we packaged them ourselves and put stamps on them. But now you can just say, hey, make me a shirt, you know, t-shirt yeah. company. And they have services that do that. And then for subs, for, you know, mm -hmm. which are the first dollar we've made for subscriptions, you can do Patreon now. But it does make it easier. But every time you do something that's easier, it's, you don't, you're not getting the full benefit of it. And mm -hmm. it is hard to establish those things on your own. And it's, I mean, it's a long slog, 15 years. Uh, but it's been worth it. I'm really glad we took the steps that we made, you know. And the other, the other thing too, too, is if we found something that worked from a business perspective, we never let it go. There were times, especially like late, you know, 2000s, like 2008, 2009, when everyone was like, stop make, doing everything, don't do merch, don't do websites, yeah. oh, YouTube, 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 just everybody, that's all there is. YouTube and Facebook, that's, the, the internet's gonna be just that in a couple of years, and a lot of people did that. A lot of really big companies went all in on YouTube, and it's, we never did that. We yeah. always knew it was important to stay diverse. And from a story perspective, there were times when people were, were saying, you can't do long form narrative series. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, Serial, remember, serialized yeah, content. Yeah, you can't do serialized content. We, and, we started Rebel Blue, said, don't make serialized content. Yeah, just make one off, quick hit things that people watch and then forget about, and then make the nec next one like that. And we kind of just kind of thought, well, this, it's working for us. It's working for us. I think we're going to stick with it, you know? What I said too is my approach with that was, and serial content has, I think, over the last decade too, has become more important because all the all everyone who makes content is dealing with this noise floor, or this glut of content that we all have, which is great for viewers. It's also great for content creators. There's lots of funding out there, but you have to figure out a way to to get to the engagement level, which is something we've always uh, strived for. And now it's like highly serialized content, like shows like Walking Dead and Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. There's huge investment and people watch them for a long time and the serial part of it is important. But when we started, they were told, no, you can't make serial content, it's comedy. You have yeah. to, it's just like you said, it's gotta be episodic. And they start at this point and then by the end of the episode, you have to reset everything so it doesn't matter and you can watch them out mm -hmm. of order. My answer to that was always, why would I write a show for the people that don't watch it? It doesn't make right, any sense. Right, right. Write it for who's watching it. Mm -hmm. One more question, okay? okay. Was it okay the question? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I wanted to ask, was there ever a point where you faced a challenge that almost set you back, that almost made you give up on this? Because obviously it is where it is because through perseverance and through right. moving forward. But was there ever a point where you thought, I, I don't know if we can keep doing this? Hmm. I mean, we've had a lot of really tough moments over the years. I mean, 2015... Yeah. For me and uh, for everybody, it was really hard because, uh, you know, Monty, mm. who was our longtime friend and collaborator, passed away. My yeah. father passed away that year. It was just like, a, it was a really tough year. Yeah. But, um, and Monty, the, the core value you're talking about of, of yeah. keep moving yeah. forward, it's, it's from Monty. And he had something you always said. And I mean, he was, you know, he was unknowingly preparing us for our biggest challenge we were mm. face, you know, when he passed away. And it was tough. But we had this team that Monty himself had built. Uh, we had a lot of faith in the show, and, and, and uh, you know, the audience was already there. Uh, they weren't what they are today, but there was that core audience mm -hmm. that was, you know, willing to go through that with us. And it's, it's uh, that was by far, I think, I mean, if, in, for me, Matt might have a different answer, but I, that was for me the toughest thing we faced. So yeah. I think it's hard to compare anything else to it. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank right. you. Yeah.